as a blind person, you can either make a choice to not adapt and kind of let things happen around you and kind of ride that wave, so to speak, or you can choose to give the choice to adapt and to have the mindset of living the full life. Welcome to the Clusive Podcast. To learn more about our fee learning platform built for the blind community to help remove barriers to employment, head online to clusive.io, that's C-L-U-S-I-V dot I-O, or click the link in the description. Today we have Simon Bonifant, and I'm looking forward to having a great conversation. My name is Blake Steinica. I'm the growth manager for Clusive. And here we also have Luke. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Luke Seminar, the CEO and founder of Clusive. Excited to have this podcast today. Yeah, hi, Blake and Luke and all the listeners. It's great to be with you. I'm really excited to do this. It's a treat for me because I'm kind of sitting on the other side of the the uh, figurative uh, interview desk here because as we'll hear about later in the podcast, I am a podcaster myself, and it's great when I can sit back and tell my story and not have to do all the work. <laughs> so. It's very exciting to have, have Blake doing the work on this one. I, too, am I'm with you. It's uh, it's fun to be uh, on a podcast and kind of kickstarting our own, which much of which was uh, inspired by you. You showed us how great of a mechanism that could be to reach people and let them know about us at a very early stage in the company, Simon. Oh, thank you. Awesome. So Simon, as you know, Clusive, we uh, deal, we are an e-learning platform and education is a big part of what we do. So I was just curious, what's been your experience like as a blind student? Yeah. Well, just to give everyone a bit of uh, context, I am currently a student and I'm in college. I'm a sophomore at Cheston Hill College in Philadelphia, and that's where I was born and raised. And... I am majoring in communications, so the goal that I'm going to eventually do is to work in the technology field. That's one of my passions, and um, yeah, really, my education has been a very, very pivotal role in my success and the person that I am today. So just to start from where my journey began, so I was born blind, and uh I have retinopathy of prematurity, so I was born early, and that's the result of my blindness. And uh, I, well, I, I'd say as soon as I was born, my family always treated me as anyone else would. Uh, I was not different because I was blind. I was treated uh, equally and with respect. And I was taught that I could do anything that I wanted to do and to push past the limitations and really be in control of my life and whatever I wanted to do. Uh, my family was not a stranger to blindness and the visually impaired landscape. Uh, I have a family member that's, that's uh, legally blind, my great aunt. Her name is Lucy Rosania. She's 81 years old, and she has a condition called achromatopsia. And so she's legally blind, so she has low vision. And she's really always been a role model to the family, to me, as I was growing up and still today. So she had a very successful life. She was a secretary to several law clerks in the 1960s and 70s when there wasn't the ADA and there wasn't these measures put in place for the blind and certainly not as much technology as there is today. And she succeeded. She did anything she wanted to do. She was a cook. Uh, she was very successful in her work. And she really showed my family that Blindness doesn't have to be a barrier to anything that we do. So as I was born and as I was growing up, as I said, that was the thing that I internalized throughout my life. And when I started school, from my grade school, I went to a school for the blind here in Philadelphia called St. Lucy School. It's a Catholic school. And the format of the school is one that's very unique. 
uh, the only one in the country that I know of that's like this. So while they are a school for the blind, they have a mainstream component. So the blind students get integrated and mainstreamed in with the sighted students for certain classes uh, as they go on. And it really is a way for students as they grow up to not just be in with blind students, but also to learn the workings of being a student with the sighted and learning the way the world works in terms of advocacy and all that. So I started to do that and I was very successful in that. And that school was also the really the building blocks, the foundation for my blindness journeys where I learned Braille and learned technology skills and learned mobility, cane travel, all the things that were very important for me to succeed in growing up and to build upon. And it was there that I was introduced to the National Federation of the Blind and I was very young when I got into that organization. I was 10 years old. So at the time I was the youngest member and, uh, <laughs> and I, I will say that uh, one of the reasons that I got into the organization at such a young age is because I've always been outgoing. I've always been a social person. One of the reasons why I love the work that I do with my podcast and all that, I always was very, um, very social and wanting to learn, wanting to advocate, um, wanting to be mature and take charge of things in my own life and always try to help other people as well. So when I got into the National Federation of the Blind, that's really where I got my network of all different role models uh, people that are succeeding in jobs of any kind and living in many countries and, you know, many states throughout the country and doing anything that we want to do. And, um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, Luke, in your other podcast is we are the CEO of our own life. And I just love that quote that you mentioned because I feel like that's a good way to describe the philosophy of the National Federation of the Blind. The way we describe it is uh, you can live the life you want. So it's really taking charge of your life and having the self-confidence that you want to have. Um, so that's how I got in there. And then in my high school, I went to Archbishop Carroll High School. Uh, which was a regular Catholic school. I was the only blind student there. And uh, I did I did very well there. And now up to me being in college now, uh, I am president of the Pennsylvania Association of Blind Students as part of the National Federation of the Blind of Pennsylvania. And... Uh, all those experiences that I've had really have led me to work well in this role and uh, do a great job with that. Um, so that's really how my foundation started and my advocacy started. That's awesome. It, it, it's really cool to hear the success you've had throughout all your education, uh, but I'm curious, what was the transition like going from a school for the blind to a school where you're the only blind student what what challenges did you did you face there uh yeah it, it wasn't the easiest thing at first i'd say um i'd say it did come with several challenges just being acclimated to the fully sighted culture um with certain things being visual or certain um, <clears throat> conversations that people were having that were things that I didn't know about because they were more visual or things like that. Uh, but overall, I really just just embraced it and just I just was myself. you know I was I, I was always myself and always very outgoing and uh, 
I, I always made myself very approachable and I always talk about that to people that as blind people were very approachable, were basically like the same person as anybody else would be just blind. Um, so I always, you know, I always uh, try to uh, make that a big part of my daily life. And of course there was challenges with uh, advocating with teachers and professors. And that's something yeah. that I continue to struggle with in college now. Um, there were certain things that were challenging for me. I'd say one of the things was math um, was a big challenge. And some of them were visual sciences um, were a bit of a challenge for me. But really when I look back, all the advocacy work that I did and all that all that teaching that I did uh, to other people really pays off and, uh, you know, really just prepares me for the next thing or the next turtle that may come up in my life. So, yeah, overall, it was a great experience for me. Yeah. I, I, I think having that mindset and advocacy experience helps so much because so much of navigating college or the workforce is it, with dealing with vision loss is uh, so much advocacy. So it's cool to have that experience. And I totally feel you that math can definitely be such a big challenge. Uh, and at least for me in college, it was definitely difficult and frustrating and uh, required some extra tutoring from all, my brother, I would say, for some of the classes when it's uh, not always the most accessible thing with a screen reader or whatever it might be. But uh, that's definitely something I've had conversations with Luke about of how do you make math more accessible when things don't work as well with a screen reader? Uh, it can things can just get so much more complex. But I feel like it's an interesting area of accessibility. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it really ties into that whole. You know, you mentioned that quote, Simon: "Be the CEO of your own life." And you said, you know, um, to you that meant self confidence, right, um, and the willingness to speak up and advocate. And I agree. That's you know. Uh, Maybe that's a big part of the ball game, but I think the foundational part, even deeper than that, is really um, self-discipline, right? Mm -hmm. The self-discipline to get better, to learn how to like fill those knowledge gaps, because that's, I mean, sighted, blind, uh, any 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 disability or none at all, regardless. Uh, if you're not a formidable human, right? If you're not putting yourself to be disciplined and push forward, it, it gets really hard, right? You find yourself being reactive to life instead of on the proactive side of things. And absolutely, absolutely. Yes. You have to, to have resilience. You have to have strength. You have to believe in yourself to accomplish your goals. Uh, you know, like I had said, my, my schooling was not easy. Uh, I'd say it's still not easy. You know, it, it, it takes work. It takes hard work. Um, but, you know, there's a reason why I have a very high GPA, a 4.0 GPA. I made the dean's list on every semester in my college. It's because I, I work hard. And I have that in the forefront of my mind that I have to have the discipline. I have to have the... Uh, the grit to stick with it and then good things will come and then they have come for me and that's what I really see and and I think it also shows people that it it shows people uh, the accomplishments show people that we as blind people can compete at a level playing field with the sighted uh, which is very important and it shows people that if we got to this point, you know, we have credibility and we have integrity and in that we can achieve our goals just as much as anyone else can. So, No, definitely. And I think that this brings up a really exciting area that, you know, I've never been on a podcast that digs into before, which is, you know, support systems, motivation mechanisms, and so forth, right? Um, you know, we all have our different life experiences. And for you, you know, you've displayed that you're driven, you're motivated, um, you know, and you've, you've gotten through those hurdles to a point where you now have like, call it this reflexive muscle, right. For, for knowing how to advocate, how to help others. But 
for those listeners, both sighted and blind, that are in their lives that, uh, you know, they're facing those challenges, right? What were some of the things that, that you as, as a blind individual leaned on, right? Where did you draw strength from? What inspired you? Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well <laughs> yeah. I think it would be seeing people that are role models to me doing things that I want to do. Um, and then seeing that in myself and then saying, what do I have to do to get there? Uh, what can I do to get like, give us an, give like us an that, example. That I want to get, I want to get anecdotal with this. Tell me, uh, l- lay it out <laughs> for me, Simon. Uh, well, I think <laughs> I'm trying to think of specific people and things, but I think one of the things would be the podcasting. Um, okay. even before that I got into my own work with podcasting, uh, and for those who don't know, I work for the blind abilities podcast, uh, where we featured a wonderful interview with you, Luke, uh, back in the summer. Yeah. So yeah, for me. A good example of that would be the podcasting and the fact that um, before I got into the the hot seat, I guess, uh, interviewing other people, I would see podcasters that are in the blindness field and that are not, just some people on the radio, some people on the news, some people on podcasts doing uh, interviews. And I thought to myself, I could do that. I could be a really good person to share people's story and to bring it out of people and give people the platform that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise if they didn't have a connection like me. Um, And one of the things that I do with that is listening skills and, and just having an understanding for, for people. Um, Maybe it's, a little bit of like a compassion for people and say, and like what they're going through and putting yourself in somebody's shoes, kind of a thing and asking thought provoking questions. Um, so that for me was like a skill that I, that I worked up to and I, I never had any, um, any hesitancy towards that. So uh, I know a lot of people have a fear of public speaking. Um, that's actually one of the worst fears in the world. I, I read that in a book recently. Um, but for me, I never really could relate to that. I was always someone that like just went on it uh, uh, head on, really. And uh, the other point to your question would be I always show gratitude to people. I always show my appreciation. Um, I always want to give back to people. Uh, this is kind of why I give back to the blindness community from what I've learned and the people that have helped me. But I always try to do something nice for people. That's what I always encourage others to do. Um, it, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be monetarily. It doesn't have to be a big, big thing. But just showing people your appreciation for helping you or taking the time to do something for you or, or whatever that might be. Um, because, because the reality is we all need people. Um, one of the quotes actually from my great aunt that I talked about earlier, she taught me is use people, but don't abuse people. So that means, you know, you can use people, you're going to have to use people for help, right? But don't abuse people and make it so, you're not getting back to that basically is, is that like, yeah. I, like I think that. that that echoes a lot of the sentiment. And I, I, you know, if I were to synthesize what all of what you just told me for our listeners, I would say that the biggest thing is, is you never really let yourself be victimized, right? You never sat there and said, well, I'm blind. I can't do that. Or I shouldn't do that. Or that would be extra hard. You know, it sounds like you, you, took that and he said, well, that might be extra hard, but shit, that's a good reason to go after it. Um, and that, I think that kind of mentality is, is so needed in our world. You know, we've got a, a a 24 hour news stream 
that if you want to find something negative to be concerned about, you you literally just have to listen to any one of those channels for, for more than 10 minutes. Uh, you know, we've got a million and one things going on these days. And uh, I think a lot of people find themselves, you know, feeling a bit powerless, feeling a bit helpless. Um, and in some capacities, we all are as humans, right? We're on a giant rock flying around. But um, we very much have control over our own lives, or at least a husband. And yeah. that right there, that I'm I'm not a, a victim. I'm, I'm moving forward. I'm doing this thing. I'm taking these challenges um, and, and turning, you know, turning losses, if you will, into lessons is a key point of that. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I totally relate to you. the importance of having people that are good examples in your life. I think a lot of people undervalue and especially undervalue people that believe in you as I feel like I've had a lot of people in my life since my vision loss that have, I don't want to say like, have just been really annoying how much they believe in me because when I've wanted to lower the bar for what I thought I could do, they're out here raising the bar and showing what's possible. Like whether that's with the work that they do as a blind person or with their family, whatever that may be. And then they put the pressure on me because they know I can do it too. Uh, I feel like it helps to have like those good examples that I would almost call annoying at times because it's, they <laughs> show you it's possible and it challenges you. So I, I super related to, to your point there. Yes. And I think it does go back to that quote, Luke, about being the CEO of your own life, which uh, really, when you think about it, the main uh, takeaway from that point is we can take charge of our own life and make decisions. And we make decisions every day, whether that be big or small or what have you. So really, that point in and of itself at a surface level is something that we all identify with. But then when you go deep below that surface level, that victim mentality is a real thing that people have and that people have to face with. And when you look at this and say, being the CEO of my life is an intentional thing. It's, it's an intentional mindset. It's an intentional philosophy that I can have to say, I'm going to push myself further and do whatever I want to do. And, and yes, we all have external circumstances. We all have things that Maybe this might be hard for someone, but it might be easy for another because of X, Y, and Z, whatever. We all have those things internally and externally. But once we can focus on a goal and then come up with that problem-solving um, strategy, that, that's a big thing. And I think we as blind people can really play a pivotal role in uh, things like accessibility and some of the problems that we have and that we see in our society because chances are if we as blind people are having a problem as an individual that is related to blindness there's other people out there that have either faced that problem or are also searching for the answer to that problem and that could be collaborative or you know just to help in in that way so that's another point as well. Uh, one of the things I could touch on here is that I just got back from Washington, D.C., actually, with the National Federation of the Blind. We have uh, every year we have a program called Washington Seminars, a conference, and people from all over the 50 states come and we lobby Congress and we speak to the congressmen and the senators about several bills that we would like to get passed to increase the accessibility and the overall general welfare for the blind. And basically what we're doing here is we're taking this, you know, these are problems and we're not just sitting around and we're not just saying, wow, these are big issues. How uh, we want to solve these problems, you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're taking the stand and saying as American citizens, this is something that we can do that will help blind people all over the country. And we go and, and make our voices heard and make our presence known. And yes, it is a slow process at times, but things do get done. 
we, we show up and that's how progress is made. You know, when, when you look at it that way. Well, it's, it's definitely a piece by piece process there. And I think, uh, you know, I, I see these parallels between the veteran community and the blind community. Um, and it's, it's actually something I'm working on writing a bit about in the background here, but, uh, you know, reasons aside, whether it's, you know, I've gone through some trauma, I've gone through these difficulties or my life significantly changed given X event, right? Whether that's warfare, loss of vision, loss of a loved one, um, you know, the commonality is probably even wider spread. But for me, I'm a wounded veteran myself and um, coming from, you know, helping other vets uh, through college and, and leading a couple of veteran organizations and then now lead inclusive where you know, we're, we're not fighting for blind people, we're fighting alongside the blind community. And uh, just the commonalities, right? The tenaciousness in the blind individuals, uh, the the willingness to, to, you know, collaborate really is a huge thing. And when you said that, you know, we gotta, if one person's facing a problem, um, certainly someone else is, is having a similar one, right? Whether it be with access or you name it. And, um, that's something that the veteran community over time has iterated on quite a bit, right? Just industry has driven it. Um, news has driven it. And I think that the that's probably one of the next steps in the blind communities, right? How how do we enable this this cross pollination, right? There's kind of these different different parties within the blind community, I guess if you would. Mm -hmm. But there's yeah. also um there's not uh so far as I can tell, outside of like government funded stuff or, or lighthouses, which nothing against either of those, of course, but, uh, there's not a lot of self-started, you know, community groups like, like what, uh, you've got yourself involved in Simon. Mm -hmm. But I also, I want to hit you with a few questions. All right, Simon, would you rather fight 10 fifth graders or 10 horse sized ducks? Probably 10 fifth graders because, uh, I don't know if you get some angry, angry kids, uh, you might be in for some some fighting going on there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because because kids can speak and uh, horses can't. So, <laughs> something can... Re the reputational harm might be a bigger risk. <laughs> <laughs> it may just be a verbal fight. It would be worse. <laughs> Simon just makes them all cry. <laughs> all right, last, <laughs> last ridiculous question. Slightly less ridiculous. Which superpower would you not want, Simon? Um, I would probably I don't know <laughs> I don't know what superpowers I could have uh, <laughs> I mean it's infinite you can make it up yeah I would not want the superpower to smell like farts. <laughs> but then again, like that could be a benefit in some situations. <laughs> yeah, you do it to people you don't like, you know. <laughs> Crowded room. Clean a room. Um, I would say, um, I, mean, I would not, I would not want the superpower to know the future, mm. because, because then we wouldn't have, okay, because then maybe I wouldn't have as much ambition to do certain things if I knew the outcome of it was going to be good or bad or whatever. If I knew all that outcome, maybe I wouldn't do certain things. So I would say I like the experience of things rather than, you know, just the outcome if it's going to be good, bad, or whatever. And I would find out some not so good things like, you know, if I knew the future, I knew when I would die or new things, you know, bad things that would come up in later years of my life. So I would say I like to live in the moment, so I would not want to know the future. Yeah. It would oh, be, yeah. Is that a good one? Oh, that's a great one. I mean, <laughs> life points in there. And I would say that, you know, you'd probably be able to make an easier decision about the fifth graders or the horse. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Uh, you would be able to know which one you'd win. <laughs> but uh, I, I'll, I'll I'll jump in with one, Simon. Do you, do you have a a good awkward, sure, just silly blind story? Yes, 
Ah, uh, that's that's a good one. Um, I think yeah, okay. One of the biggest ones for me. A lot of people will be able to relate to this one. One of the biggest ones for me is uh, I'll be talking to somebody, uh, you know, at like an event or something like that, and they'll just walk away and I won't know anything as to where they are. And I'll be sitting there talking away, having a big conversation and I might pause or something and I hear no response. And I, if I realize that I'm kind of like, all right, well, that was embarrassing, but I'm just going to stand here or do something else. But I have had the unfortunate, embarrassing situations of people coming up to me and says, uh, who are you talking to? And I said, I'm talking to so-and-so. And they say, they're not here. That's kind of why I, uh, you know, hide in a corner. <laughs> well, you know, I think the proper response, Simon, when that happens is you should say, just because you can't hear the voices doesn't mean they're not real. <laughs> if I wasn't already thought as crazy, I probably would be then, but okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes you just got to get the reaction out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness! No, I I feel I feel like there's there's so many of those awkward, silly moments that we'll have, and I feel like it's so helpful to laugh about it, and I feel like it's good good to hear you laughing about it, and I feel like it's it's a helpful added confidence piece to know like when it's okay to laugh about these things. I'm I'm sure you found as it's it's frustrating, but also I don't know, have you found it to be helpful just laughing at these? Oh yeah! Things? Oh yeah! Yeah! Yeah, you gotta laugh, and then when you get with a whole bunch of blind people, you could all share stories and you know relate to each other. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> the, you know, I always just I always think back, and it was such a a funny moment, but humbling moment when when Bruce, our own guy, it was one of our first meetings um, that Bruce is on with us, and uh, this might have been before you. Like, I'm not sure. I think I was here. It was really early on, and I pulled up this PowerPoint presentation for the team on a team meeting. I was like, all right, can everybody see my screen? And Bruce, the smart ass, said, well, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a funny thing. The entire team laughed. Bruce burned me, and I got the CEO. But it was one of those like also very sweet moments because it was, hey, you know, I actually you know, I can't see your screen. Are you going to narrate this, this presentation? Mm -hmm. And it was a very like, to me, that is like the coolest thing of, of having the team that we do and, and really getting to work with the blind community in general is, you know, yeah, there's shit happens and it can be funny and, and here's how we make it better. Right. Or here's how we approach it. And, uh, it's those, those funny stories always get me. Although yeah. I do hope you use the voices thing next time. Right? Uh, yeah. Maybe I will. I'll do that. Yeah. I, I like joking around and. I think that's something that we have to do. You know, we have to find the humorous side of things and laugh. And you know that quote, uh, laughter is the best medicine, you know? Yeah. Oh, and it's, you know, it's one of those things that transfers over to it's no matter what you're going through. If I, mm -hmm. I remember my first few years back from Afghanistan, every time there was a noise louder than a dog fart, I would shit about hit the ground and duck and look like an idiot. And then, like, you know. How do you make fun of that? How do you joke about it so that, like, mm -hmm. not just some weirdo in a Walmart parking lot freaked out? <laughs> if, mm. I mean, you have to find these these mechanisms. Uh, yeah. And I think it helps to diffuse tension because, yeah. you know, a lot of times in the sighted world, people are so scared to say the wrong things to us or, or they're going to offend us or something like that. And it's like, no, I'm not going to be offended. I mean, if you say the wrong thing, I'll I'll correct you and I'll say, you know, the right word is this, or you could say this better or do this differently, whatever. But I'm not going to be offended. You know, that's that's like a common misconception I think we have. And the more that we could just be lighthearted and outgoing and be like open to other people, the more that they're gonna kind of draw on that that vibe and want to spend time with us and all that. I think that's absolutely critical for, for furthering the advancement and employment opportunities and getting rid of the, the unemployment rate in the black community, right? The, we have a, a, a culture now, especially surrounding like human resources, hiring and everything that's so politically correct that it's, it's turned into people being afraid to be wrong. 
right? Mm-hmm. They're afraid to say the wrong thing. So thus, why don't I avoid the situation completely? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, instead of me having that interaction with Bruce, I could be so scared that I'm like, well, how many blind people can actually hire? And, you know, I've learned in the time since that, like, there's just the the fact that 60% of inclusive, if not more, I'd have to do the math as of today, uh, is blind and low vision is one of our superpowers. Mm-hmm. But how do we convey that to the big companies of the world uh, mm-hmm. who really have, you know, a ton of hiring opportunities every year? And, and you know, one of the things you had mentioned to me when we had talked before about this, this topic of problem solving is that blind and visually impaired people are one of the best problem solvers. I believe you said that to me. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, I've heard that from other people, but I, I specifically remember you saying that. Um, and that is so true because we live it in our lives. Um, but one of the and things built for you. Yeah. You're right. That's right. We, we, yeah, we have to. We have to, or else we don't, or else we lose out on doing something we want to do, or uh, you know, whatever that case may be. Uh, what I describe it to people as: all we're doing is adapting. Mm. We're adapting to our life situation. Yeah, you can either, as a blind person, you can either make a choice to not adapt and kind of let things happen around you and kind of ride that wave, so to speak, or you can choose because there's a choice. You can choose to adapt and to have the mindset of living the full life. And once we make that choice to adapt, all that really is, is finding ways to do things that our sighted counterparts can do. We just do them a little differently. That, that's all it is. It comes down to a, a pretty simple thing. Um, all right, Trevor. <laughs> uh, one of the other things I wanted to get into, and and you might have some some uh, questions about this. Uh, in my local area, I am a consultant with a company called Philly Touch Tours, and uh, we have this uh, mantra in everything we do called "Nothing about us without us." So sure. when we are, uh, I'll get into what the company does in a minute, but when we are um, working as a company and, and and anything we do, we, we think about nothing about blind people without our input uh, because we're the ones that know best, okay? And, and, and that really is a belief that runs through the National Federation of the Blind, uh, runs through the organization I'm about to talk about now. We, we have this belief that people that don't know our situation can't speak for us and can't um, say what we need because we're the only ones that actually know what we need. Um, now, in terms of the company, Philly Touch Tours, I work as a consultant for them and we go around to uh, museums and uh, universities and other cultural institutions uh, and we develop custom programs for the blind. So people that have never worked with the blind before that want to make their exhibits or their video or audio, things like that accessible, they bring us in as a company and we work with them to um, teach them about disability etiquette and about, you know, the, the myth dispelling. Uh, that can sometimes be kind of, kind of funny because we we usually talk about this whole thing of like, oh, can blind people uh, mind read or can blind people, you know, do like stupid stuff? You know, it's like no, you know. Um, so that that's a big part of it, and then and then as as the end result, I don't know, we go through and train them, give them recommendations on verbal description. And um, we just actually did a consult with a a museum that's doing audio description. And we had a group of blind people as consultants sit down and look at the first uh, product of this audio description and say, okay, this was created by a sighted person, but what can we add? What can be 
you know, change? What do we like? What do we not like? And then we bring that feedback to the museum and uh, they make the suggestions accordingly. So it's all, all in with the theme of us making the decisions that are going to most benefit our community. That's awesome. It, it, it's so cool to get that ex experience where you can use your lived experience and uh, just help make an impact there. And I, I know you mentioned that you have a passion to work in accessibility or assistive technology in the future. Could you, could you share more about kind of what you think about wanting to do after college? Yeah, well, I, I don't know yet in terms of where life's going to take me fully, but for sure, I, I, I know that I definitely want to work with um, either blindness technology products or regular technology products to make it the most accessible that it can be, uh, whether that be with website design or app design or um, things along those lines, because technology is really a passion for me and I love to to learn new programs and products and software and all that. It, it, it because technology really opened my whole world up. Um, you know, it 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 allows us to do what we're doing today. I mean, look at <laughs> Zoom, look at podcasts, and look at you know all the things, YouTube videos, whatever the case may be. That's all like eye opening and. You know, at, at one time would have been mind blowing to the society, but now it's really such a big part of our world. And for blind people, it's really the door that is either closed or open to the rest of society. Um, not only just in the workforce and in our daily life, but also the connection that we can have with people online. Uh, there is a, a very strong blind community all over the internet from all around the world that I've been a part of for a long time. And it's again, that, you know, connecting from all different walks of life, all different, uh, uh, geography, uh, uh, geographical locations coming together because we have that common commonality, that common ground, which is blindness that really can connect a lot of people. So, um, the more that I could work to advance, the the lives of blind people by having websites accessible or things like that. That's what I would love to do. And and also, uh, I'm sure something you could touch on, Luke, as well, is having that valued with payment and with, uh, you know, monetary value really makes a professional, it, it really makes it a professional situation. Um, I think so many times there is this idea that blind people could do things for free or volunteer or things like that, which we can and we do. But really, there, there is, has started to be a shift and is coming of more of a shift where blind people are valued for our work, for our expertise, for our lived experiences. Because really, without that information, th things wouldn't be where they are today in terms of the progress that we have. I mean, when I work with the the Philly Touch Tours as a consultant, I, I'm I'm brought on to work with them. Uh, shout out to the founder and uh, creative director Chris Monder and Catherine Allen, who are the founders of that organization, and. Uh, I, I get paid to do that job and it's, it's a good feeling, you know, it, it's a good feeling to be valued that way. No, I, I completely agree. And I, I think that, uh, you know, I'm very rarely, in fact, I'm adamantly against all of the counts, the cancel culture idiocy, but, uh, on a somewhat similar note, I think that there needs to be a vast shaming of anybody who's like, yeah, I'm going to do my product QA by having blind individuals voluntarily test this, right? Or like unpaid internships. Like, no, you know, you, you wouldn't get a sighted intern to QA something for you, right? Unless it's a college student leading up to a job, in which case, you know, maybe that's fair game. Right. But the way that it's been used um, in the past, and even when I was building Clusify, so many people, uh, you know, say, well, why don't you just 
you know, ask people from from the school for the blind or blah blah blah. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna pay them. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that's not that's not how this works. Um, and I, I think that you know the that nothing for us without us has to just be incredibly incredibly loud and strong and and i think it needs to be directed at even bigger companies and targets right there's some of the biggest companies in this world that spend billions of dollars on product research they outsource their accessibility to firms of completely sighted people right and then they think that by hitting a guideline they've developed a usable product which we all know is the furthest thing from the truth and so uh you know, those sentiments, I think, should be echoed incredibly loud. And, uh, you know, I, I can't tie in enough how, you know, a startup is one of the hardest environments to work in. I, I think any of my team would probably attest that, you know, coming, most of my team came from somewhat traditional career backgrounds prior. Blake aside, I think Blake's the one outlier, really, um, who had kind of worked in smaller businesses and startups in the past. But uh, it's hard. You wear a lot of hats. Your mission shifts often. Your priorities shift often, um, and you have to constantly adjust to new intelligence, and new information, and learnings from around the team, right? Uh, and if if I can do that in a startup with more than half my employees being blind or low vision, there's absolutely no reason the biggest companies in the world who are a lot more stable, you know, can't take the time to to implement accessible practices and training, but I'll get off my soapbox on the <laughs> nine there. Um, but needless to say, I think you're you're definitely driving in the right direction, Simon. And as always, it's a pleasure to connect with you and uh, glad to get your story out there, man, and, and have you on the other side of the seat. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh yeah. You know, one of the other things that I do too, and I, I, I want to mention this because I want to, you know, show people that uh yes, while I'm in uh, the blindness community and a lot of things that I do are for are with the blind. I'm not all, uh, all, you know, in, in one spot, I guess. Uh, one of the other things that I do is I'm a musician, I'm a singer and a piano player. Um, so I really enjoy doing that. And I'm also an actor uh, for a theater group called Acting Without Boundaries, uh, which is a local theater group or people with disabilities, again, with the same kind of uh, mission of just getting people out there and doing something that they love to do. And really these two things of me being a musician, an actor, uh, really kind of tie into all the other work that I do because I have that that drive and that um, that passion. You know, I, I, I do performances. Um, I actually recently got a job as a singer, uh, as a cantor for a church. And again, it's one of these other things where I'm making money doing something that I love to do and that I do well and that I can really um, shine in and and also give back to other people and bring joy to other people. You know, music is kind of this thing that I think all of us uh, can love and can get into with whatever style of music or what have you but for me as a musician it's about giving back to other people and also you know showing them joy and uh showing them a good time if you will <laughs> there you yeah. go uh, uh that that's super cool to hear and just to know the having those hobbies and other things we do i feel like is so essential to navigating life with as a blind person and I, I think that's so cool to hear, and I, f- I feel like we'd, we'll have to have you on again to talk more about all the other, all the different things you can do. As it brings up so many other other questions and things to talk about, but I appreciate all the value that you've been able to share from your story and things with our audience. Uh, if people want to connect with you, where can they find you? Sure. So you can find me on Twitter at the Tech Kid One Two Three. That's T H E T E C H K I D One Two Three. Although I will say I do not use Twitter much anymore because of the uh, things that have been happening and there's been a lot of accessibility downturns with Twitter. So I don't go on there as much as I once did, but I am on there if you want to connect with me there. Um, On Facebook, you can search my name, Simon Bonifant. And then if you'd like to subscribe to the podcast that I work for, Blind Abilities, you can go 
to www.blindabilities.com. And uh, I am a contributor to that. So the the main uh, founder and CEO of that is uh, Jeff Thompson from Minnesota. Um, and then I work uh, alongside him to uh, put together the podcast. So if you want to find my content there, you can go to blindabilities.com and type in my name in the search box, Simon Bonifant, and uh, you can see all the podcasts that I've done there. And Clusive is one of the ones on there. So if you want to check that out and hear more of that uh, excellent interview that we did, I would highly encourage you to do so. And I thank you so much for listening. I hope that you all enjoyed the podcast today and enjoyed the topics that you heard us speak about. And I hope that this inspires you. And my last word of advice would be to always uh, never give up on your dreams and always keep persevering because hard work will pay off. Thank you so much. There you go. That, that'll be it for the Clusive Podcast with Simon Bonifant. Well, wise words there. Thank you, everybody, for listening.